All right, so uh, this week, this week we're, we're actually wrapping up a series. Uh, we started several weeks ago called Peaks and Valleys, where we've been taking some time and, and just talking about the highs and the lows of, of faith, right? Because faith isn't always an easy thing, is it? Like, yeah, there's going to be times in our faith journey when everything is going really, really well. When God is going to be working in these big and powerful ways and you're going to look around and be like, God, like you are just everywhere. Like, how could anybody not believe that God is out there, right? Like, there are going to be times in our faith journey when God does big things, but then there's going to be the lows. The difficult times, the difficult seasons of life when you're going to look around and be like, God, where are you? Are you even there? Are you even paying attention and faith is filled with these ups and downs highs and lows peaks and valleys and we're constantly weaving between the two and so what we've been doing or trying to do hopefully through this series is talk about that talk about the ups and the downs of faith by looking at the life of Elijah and the reason why I like Elijah for this is because he really just sort of experiences the whole gambit doesn't he he experiences these incredible highs where everybody around him is able to see the things that God's doing. But then he also experiences lows. And the lows that he goes through can be so powerful, so overwhelming, it actually makes him forget that the good things ever happened at all. And in fact, today we're going to look at one of those stories. If you've got your Bible, uh, turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. Today we're going to be in 1 Kings 19. If you don't have a Bible, it's cool. Uh, we'll have the words on the screen behind me. But again, 1 Kings 19. And while you're turning there, just kind of a quick review on what we talked about last week. Because one of the things I love about the story of Elijah, or at least the cluster of stories that we're looking at right now, is they all happen back to back to back, right? And so in order to understand what we're talking about this week, we got to do a quick review about what we talked about last week. And last week, we wrapped up that story of uh, Elijah and his confrontation with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, where Elijah goes to King Ahab, remember, and he says, okay, I want you to gather everybody at Mount Carmel. And so everybody's there. And he sets this thing up where you've got all the people. You've got the prophets of Baal over here. You've got Elijah over here. And they're essentially going to have this duel of the gods where each of them are going to build an altar. Each of them are going to pray to their God. And the God that responds by bringing them fire from heaven, clearly that is the one true God. Now, this should have been super easy for Baal. Because he is a storm god, right? He's depicted in ancient literature with a lightning bolt. And so they set up their altars. Elijah says, you go first because there's a lot of you. This is going to take me a while. And so from 9 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the prophets of Baal, they shout, they pray, they dance, they even cut themselves, and nothing happens. Finally, it's Elijah's turn. Elijah steps up, says a short prayer. Fire comes down from heaven, consumes absolutely everything. Then he goes down the mountain, and has the prophets of Baal put to death. Then he goes back up the mountain, prays for rain, and rain comes enough to fill the valley that they were in. And I don't know about you. Oh, by the way, after that, he ends up running 18 miles on foot to the next city, which is crazy to think about. I, I get tired after, like, driving for 10 miles, let alone running for 18 miles. But I don't know about you. As I look at the story we talked about last week, first of all, that's what we call a peak moment, right? Like, let, let's just be really honest here. That is a mountaintop experience. And in fact, I don't know about you, but I want to see God work like that in my life, right? Like, I would love to have that kind of relationship with God where I'm praying for things, and then, like, they're happening moments later. I would love to be able to pray for rain, and then, boom, it starts raining. I don't know about the fire thing. I've, I've that's not a lot of moments in my life when I'm like, yeah, I could really use some fire right now. And I think that would be kind of dangerous, but, you know, whatever. But I, I, I would love to have that kind of relationship with God. I would love to see God work like that in my life. How about you? And in fact, how many of us are here today and we're thinking to ourselves, you know, if I saw God work like that in my life, I would never doubt again. Because we want that empirical evidence, don't we? 
We want to see the tangible proof that God is really there, that God is really with us. And we believe that if we experience God in that kind of powerful, profound way, we would never doubt again. Would we? See, funny thing is that's not always the way it works. And in fact, we're going to see that today. If you've got your Bible, 1 Kings 19, we're beginning in verse 1. Here we go. 1 Kings 19, 1 says this, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done. Really quick, when, when you see this first word here, it says now Ahab. The word now means like immediately after. Are you with me? So this is like, this picks up immediately after immediately after where we left off last week. It's not like two weeks have gone by, a month went by, Ahab was like, oh yeah, forgot to tell you about how that whole thing with, with Elijah worked out. Yeah, that didn't go over so well. Like, no, 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 no. This is immediately after. So like, right away. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I don't make your life like one of them. So Ahab tells Jezebel, the queen, what had happened. Now, one of the things you need to understand is that, yes, Ahab is the king, right? But Jezebel is the one who's really in charge. Right, like she's the one who's really pulling the strings. It's like one of my favorite quotes from this movie, uh, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. This is one I've referenced a lot. I'm going to do it again because it fits so perfectly. I know it's an older reference. I get it. I need to update my, my, my movie quotes. I get it. But the, the, it's just too perfect, right? There's this great quote in My Big Fat Greek Wedding where the mom says, Yes, the husband is the head of the house. But the wife is the neck, and the neck moves the head any way she wants. That's Jezebel, y'all. Jezebel is the one who's really in charge. And so she hears what happened with Elijah and the prophets and what he did. And she's not happy about it. Because that's her prophets from her people. And she is livid. She's going to do something about it. And so she essentially sends a threatening email. Only she sends a person because it's before email. So she sends this threatening message to Elijah, basically threatening to kill him. Now, let me ask you something. If you were in Elijah's shoes, and you had just witnessed God literally bringing fire down from heaven... If you had just prayed for rain after a three-year drought and saw enough rain come to flood the wadi that they had to go through, how concerned would you be about this threat? Because I don't know about you guys, but I'd be feeling maybe a little bit arrogant, wouldn't you? I mean, let's just be really painfully honest with ourselves. How many of us would our first response be, bring it? Right? Like, bring it! Like, watch me do it again! And in fact, what's funny is a little bit later in, first, in 2 Kings chapter 1, and if you were with us maybe about uh, six weeks ago, maybe, remember we did the Curiosity and Conundrum series? You guys remember that? We talked about Elijah and the two berries ma mauling all those people. Uh, that was fun. Anyway, um, one of the stories that we referenced was this story in 2 Kings chapter 1 where a king is basically demanding Elijah come. Elijah doesn't want to go. He sends all of these troops, 50 troops and a captain. Remember that? They say, you have to come with us now. Elijah says, no, calls down fire from heaven, burns them all up. King doesn't like that, sends another troop. Same thing happens, right? Third guy goes, he says, okay, have mercy. I, like, I, I see where this is going. But my point is, is that Elijah actually does this later. And so, like, I look at this, and I'm like, surely he would look at this and be like, this is no big deal. I got this. Bring it. Watch me do it again. Which is why it's really weird that we read this. Look at the first part of verse 3. Elijah 
was afraid and ran for his life. Elijah runs. And the reason that he runs is because he's afraid. See, this is the power of fear. Let me ask you, how many of you are here with us today? Or maybe you're watching with us online and you're dealing with some sort of fear in your life right now. You know what I mean? Like that sort of residual fear that's always there. It's kind of like in the background. It's like that buzz in your life. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? And even when you're doing something when you shouldn't be thinking about it, you're thinking about it because it's always on your mind. It's always in the back of your head. Like we all have these fears. Maybe for you, you're here today and it's a job fear. Maybe your boss gave you a task that you need to get done and time is ticking and it doesn't look like it's going to happen. You're worried about the consequences. You might even lose your job over this thing. Or maybe for you, your company, like so many other companies, is starting to cut corners. And they're talking about cutting your salary or maybe even cutting your job altogether. And it's just this residual fear that's constantly like presenting itself in your life. Or maybe for you, it's school. Right? High schoolers, middle schoolers, you guys are under a lot of pressure, aren't you, to get good grades? And in fact, for some of us, you, getting good grades is absolutely essential because you have a life plan. You want to get the right grades so that you can get into the right school, so that you can get into the right job. If you don't get the right grades into the right school, into the right job, then like your whole life is going to get blown up and everything's going to fall apart. And so you got to get the right grades. By the way, I got terrible grades. I had no plan, I'm going to be honest, I had no plan as a kid or as a college student to be a pastor. This was the least job that I wanted in the world, but God has a way of taking our plans and saying, yeah, okay, that's great, but I, I want to do something else. So if you don't get the grades, listen, it's going to be okay. And in fact, okay, really moment of transparency, if you're a student and you're feeling bad about your grades, my freshman year of high school, I went from a a uh, public middle school to a private high school that was very, very difficult. My GPA dropped that first semester. Even though I was doing three hours of homework every night, my GPA dropped from a 3.5 to a 1.7. Uh-huh, yeah. And I was working like crazy. Nothing I did ever seemed to work because it was just really hard. I went to college. I was like, this is easy. Listen, grades aren't everything. God has a way of getting you exactly where he wants you to go. So if you're a student, you're stressed out about grades, you're going to be okay. So maybe for you, you're, you're, you're struggling with that. Maybe for you, it's finances. Maybe for you, you've had to cut some corners. Maybe your, your boss did cut some salaries. Maybe your job is about to end, and you're starting to wonder how you're going to make things work. Maybe for you, it's health concerns. You're worried about COVID. You're worried about uh, other things like cancer. And it's just this residual fear in your life. Or maybe for you, it's the stuff that's happening around the world. We live in a world where we're being bombarded with fear on a 24-7 basis. And the problem with fear is that fear has the potential to undo everything. Think about this. This story takes place immediately after the mountaintop experience, like maybe a day or two. In a couple of days, Elijah goes from seeing God call down fire to bringing the flood all the way to finding himself in this moment where he's running for his life. This is the power of fear because fear is the opposite of faith. Faith is moving forward knowing that God is with you, knowing that he's going to have your back no matter what. Fear is believing he isn't. And in fact, maybe this is why God speaks so strongly against fear throughout the Bible. Did you know that fear not is the most repeated command in the Bible? Because fear has the potential to ruin absolutely everything. And in fact, look at what happens as the story goes on, verse 3 continues. It says this, When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Now I want to stop here really quick. 
So he gets to Beersheba, he leaves his servant, and he goes the rest of the way alone. If you're here today and you've ever dealt with depression, if you've ever struggled with just being sad, you know that the worst thing in the world that you can do is to be alone, isn't it? Because when you're alone, you get in like the, the weird place where it's like your own headspace. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like you, you get caught up in your own headspace where you're just thinking about the thing that went wrong. And we get stuck in this downward spiral where we start thinking up the worst possible conclusions. Right? Oh no, this is going to happen. Oh, I didn't even think about this. And we just get stuck in this downward spiral. Being alone is probably one of the worst things that we can do whenever we're feeling down. And yet it's the thing that we do all the time, right? Whenever you're feeling down, leave me alone. I'm just having a bad day. I just want to be alone. Like I, I'm going through this horrible thing. I want to isolate myself. And I'm telling you, it always, always, always makes things worse. It goes on. Verse 4, he, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, hold on to that, he came to a broom bush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. So Elijah leaves his servant. He goes into the desert. He finds a broom bush. And we've talked about this before. But a broom bush is like this medium-sized bush. And what you would do is in the heat of the day, you would lay down under it. It was big enough where you can get your head under it. In the desert, you want to keep your head cool, right? It's the most important thing. And so you picture this. Elijah is laying in the desert on his back with his head under a bush, and he's praying, I've had enough, God. I wish I was dead. Again, a couple days earlier, he was on the mountain with God. He was on the mountain with God experiencing these crazy, incredible things. Again, this is the potential power of fear in your life. When you allow fear to become the driving force, it can undo everything. So he says, enough. Verse 5. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up. He looked around, and there by his head was some baked bread over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank, and then he laid down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you, and I love this. And in fact, some of you may need to underline or circle or highlight this verse. Because what this verse teaches us is that sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do is eat a snack and take a nap. And all God's people said, there we go. And it's funny, but it's, it's also true, isn't it? Sometimes the most spiritual thing that you can do is put one foot in front of the other. Especially when you're down. Especially when you're feeling depressed. It's easy to want to give up. It's easy to want to give in to cynicism. It's easy to want to give in to fear and say that everything is hopeless, that there's no way that God can redeem this situation. But as you go through the Bible, God has a very good track record of redeeming very bad situations. Sometimes the most powerful thing that we can do is just do the next thing, to just keep going. And sometimes that's eating a snack. Sometimes that's taking a nap. Sometimes when, whenever we're going through difficult seasons of life, it's easy to give up on our basic needs, isn't it? It's easy to want to focus on everything else that's going on so that we miss the very simple act of just taking care of ourselves. But the angel comes up to Elijah and says, hey, God's not done with you yet. But here's the deal. God has a plan. He's doing something in your life. But if you want to get to that, you're going to have to take care of yourself because we've still got a long way to go. Goes on. Verse 8. So he got up and he ate and he drank. Then strengthened by that food, he traveled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Oreb, the mountain of God. I think this is interesting. Because notice, when he was running from God, 
he was only able to make it one day. But when he was running to God, he was able to make it for 40 days and 40 nights. See, running from God's exhausting, isn't it? And in fact, some of us are here today, or maybe some of us are watching online, and you're living an exhausted life. And the reason you're exhausted is because God's calling you to do something. Maybe God's calling you to take a risk. Maybe God's calling you to do something that you, you've never dreamed that you would do. And it makes you uncomfortable. It's scary. And you've been running from it. And the reason you're exhausted is because God has a plan for your life. Here's, here's the one thing I know about you. Every single one of us was created with intention and purpose. God is doing something in every single one of your lives. But when God starts working in your life, he's not just working in your life. He's working in the things around your life, trying to guide you to where he wants you to be. And so when you run from God, you're actually pushing back against all the other things that God is doing in and around your life. And I want you to imagine how different it would be if you stopped fighting what God was calling you to do and to lean into the current. It's like swimming against the current, isn't it? You ever try that? It's horrible. I mean, you're just sitting there swimming like crazy. You look up and you hadn't gone anywhere. In fact, you actually went backwards because you stopped. See, some of us are spending our lives swimming against the current when if we would just turn around and trust the current that God is leading us into, you would be able to run for days. Verse 9. There, he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 10, he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites... They have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. And I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. I don't want you to miss what Elijah is saying here. Basically, here's the thing. It's easy to miss because it's just really, really heavily implied, right? But what Elijah is doing here when he says they've broken the covenant, they've torn down the altars, they're, they're killing the prophets, they're trying to take my life. Basically, what, God, what Elijah is saying here is that he's asking for God to bring judgment on Israel because they have sinned, because they have turned so far away against God. And I want you to notice the way that God responds to this goes on, verse 11, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After an earthquake of fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? So Elijah is asking God to bring judgment on Israel. And I want you to notice the way that God responds because he sends three things, right? You have wind, you have an earthquake, and you have fire. Now, all of these things are symbols of judgment, right? The strong wind that tears the mountain apart is a picture of judgment. Earthquakes, symbol of judgment. As you go through the Bible, fire's all over the place, right? All of these things are a symbol of judgment. What's God saying to Elijah? I'm not bringing judgment against Israel. I am giving them a second chance because I am working in their life. I am about to do an incredible thing, and I am not giving up on them. Instead, God responds with a gentle whisper that draws Elijah closer. God responds with intimacy. God is going to give them a second chance. 
says to Elijah, what are you doing here? And he basically says the same complaint again. And one of the things that he emphasizes is just this idea of, of loneliness. And as I think about this story, and I think about this valley moment in Elijah's life, because this is a valley, right? Like, I mean, he's going through a moment where he says, God, just take my life. That is a very, very dark time for him. And the question that we all need to ask is, how do we fight back against the valleys? How do we fight back against those difficult seasons of life? And the thing that I see coming up in this story over and over and over again is the loneliness of Elijah. He begins by, like, leaving everybody. As you go through a story over and over, he talks about how he's alone. And what's interesting about this is as you go through the rest of this chapter— even into the next, what you see is that God, the very next thing that God does is God brings him Elisha, who's going to be his disciple, who's going to end up taking over after him. God responds to the loneliness of Elijah by bringing him into community. You want to know how to fight back against the valleys? You want to know how to fight back against the difficult seasons of life? It begins with community. Because we were created to live in community. We are fundamentally designed to live in relationship with one another. We see this all the way in the creation story. It was not good for man to be alone, so God made him Eve. The Bible is filled with community. In fact, the Israelites lived in these little kind of groupings called insulas. It was these houses with houses with them, where entire families would live together. You were living with your in-laws. They needed prayer. <laughs> but everything was done in community. You went to work with your family. You did household stuff with your family. Life was lived in community. We are not meant to live alone. And if you want to fight back against the valleys of your life, it begins with community. It begins by finding and having those people in your life who are going to help build you up whenever you're feeling down. I've used this reference before. I'm going to use it again because it's great. The rabbis say that we are like logs on a fire. That when we're together, we burn bright. But what happens if you take one of those logs and like put it over here? What happens to the log? Poof. It burns out, right? Same thing is true with us and our faith. How many times have we ever tried to say, I don't need church. I'm just going to do my faith by myself. You ever do that one? You ever try that one? I did. It's called college. It didn't work very well. Because what happens, you're like, yeah, I'm going to have this great personal time with God. I can worship God anywhere. I'm going to go, like, into the woods. I never went into the woods. I slept in. I didn't have that accountability that was making me do the things that I was supposed to do. See, we are designed, fundamentally designed to live in community. And if you want to fight back against the valleys, it begins with others. It begins by having that tribe, that community of people who want what's best for you, who are going to invest in you. And in the times when your log is like burning out, when you just don't have the energy, when you don't have the passion, when you don't have the fire, when you don't want to even do a Bible study, when you don't even want to read your Bible or pray, it's those other people and the heat and the passion and the fire of those other people and their faith that keeps you going on. And we need that. You need that. I need that. All of us need community. And so as we wrap up, let me ask you, who is your tribe? Who are the people in your life that are going to speak truth to you when the world feels like it's falling apart. When you're about to make that choice that's going to lead to that regret, and you know it's going to lead to a regret, but you're feeling like your back is against the wall and you're out of options, who's that person who's going to talk some sense into you? Who are those people that you can lean on when you're struggling and you don't know how you're going to get through? We all need community. And if you're here today, or if you're watching with us online and you're desperate for community, you, you, need those, you realize you need those people, but you don't know where to start, we would love to help you out. 
here at Redeemer, we believe that community is essential. We have small groups that meet all throughout the week, and some of them are digital. We have groups that meet on Zoom uh, all throughout the week. Uh, we have one that meets on Sunday mornings. If you are here today, and you realize that you need that community, you need those people in your life, don't let today pass you by. Go to the back after worship, take a connection card, and write on there. I, I, don't, I don't even care. Like, write it in big letters if you have to. I want to be part of a small group. I need that community in your life. And listen, having people doesn't make all your problems go away. There's, there's no silver bullet. But they're going to help you. They're going to be there with you through those difficult seasons of life. Because we all need that tribe. So who's your community? Who's your tribe? Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your grace. God, thank you for your church. For the accountability of others. Because, God, we just realize that when we try to do it by ourselves, it, it just doesn't seem to work. That we need people. We need other people. We need those, those people who are going to be there for us when life falls apart. God, there are going to be times in their life when we need to be there for them. God, I pray that you would give us the courage in a time of isolation, in a lifestyle of introvertedness, give us the courage to get outside of our comfort zones and seek out other people. Seek out that community, that tribe. Because we weren't meant to do this alone. God, thank you for your church. Stand